Yeah, I'm afraid 20 years haven't made that more comfortable for me to watch. <laughs> so you may think that these ladders are a complete fantasy thing, but they're not. They're actually shown in 14th, 15th and 16th century military treatises. This is Matt Easton, a teacher of historical European martial arts who specializes in both longsword and saber fencing. We got him to react to the Helm's Deep siege in The Lord of the Rings The Two Towers, giving us his expert opinion on just how realistic this battle really is. <laughs> so I absolutely love this siege scene, but one of the things that um, always bothered me slightly about it is why do the Urukai turn up with pikes? What are the pikes for? They're one of the most useless weapons against a fortification. Pikes you use against cavalry, you use to protect your cannons if you're in the age of cannon or your artillery, your archers. But pikes, what, what are the pikes going to do to these walls? I don't know. <laughs> and literally, so it begins, holding the bow at full draw for I don't know how many minutes. Anybody who's ever done archery, I mean, even if you use a very light, I mean, they're using movie bows, so they're incredibly light to draw weight, probably 10 or 15 pounds draw weight, if that. Uh, so they can stand there all day like this. But if you're using a bow that's actually going to have any effect on enemies, especially enemies wearing armor, you've got to use a bow that at maximum you can hold at full draw, at least with an aimed shot, for about five seconds. So for the most part, with heavy war bows, you do not hold them at full draw. And the other reason you don't want to do it is it damages the bow. If you're using bows made of organic material, whether they're wood or a combination of wood, horn and sinew, then holding it at full draw is incredibly bad for the bow. So I do really love the fact that they talk about aiming for the neck and some people might, I mean, for a start, they're elves, okay? So they're super proficient with bows. They're very, very accurate. And some people think might think that kind of this kind of volley fire is never going to be aimed at specific targets. But contrary to what you often see in Hollywood where archery is often done at a very long range, actually, we know that, for example, in medieval Europe and we also know in China at various points, archery was often done at very close range. So the hand-to-hand -hand combat troops would engage the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat and then the archer would shoot from the flanks into the enemy at very close range. For example, in Frossard's Chronicles, talking about the Battle of Poitiers, it says that the French knights were scared that the arrows were going to penetrate the sides of their visors. So they're being shot from the sides at their faces. And bear in mind as well that when you've got a mass of troops and they're all collected together in a big mass, often you can only aim at their faces. If we go over to China, for example, we know that um, Manchurian archers often aimed also at the face. So completely historically valid, aiming at the face. So we did see a few examples there of arrows going through plate armor, specifically a breastplate we see there. I've got issues with this. <laughs> now, bows can be powerful indeed, and under some circumstances, arrows can penetrate thin plate. However, breastplates and helmets tend to be the thickest plates that you would have in, in armor. And if your breastplate doesn't protect you against an arrow, then why are you wearing it? <laughs> um, so by and large, uh, whilst it occasionally may have happened that arrows may have occasionally gone through certain thinner plates, some of the arm plates, some of the leg plates, uh, some of the plates that are down over the groin, and maybe occasionally neck plates, something like this, or articulations, and very often it would have found a gap. Generally speaking, arrows don't go straight through a helmet or a breastplate. So you may think that these ladders are a complete fantasy thing, but they're not. They're actually shown in 14th, 15th and 16th century military treatises talking about the art of war, how to besiege castles, things like this. And absolutely, there were siege ladders which had hooks at the top. Now, they didn't usually raise them with a person hanging onto the top. That is a fantasy element, but these are urukai, come on. Specialized siege ladders with hooks and other contraptions on them absolutely existed. I really love that they've thought to the level of detail to have what's the equivalent of Urukai berserkers. Amongst the Vikings or the Norse, they had these specialized elite troops, crack troops, special forces, we could call them. And there is some implication both in a Norse background, but equally if we look at other comparable cultures where they had a berserker type special forces that sometimes they would wear less armor. And that's what we see here. So these guys are equipped with larger Urukai swords, big two-handers, and are wearing less armor to be more 
mobile, I guess. And we do see them stabbed by various weapons because they're not wearing armor. Obviously, they're more vulnerable to arrows and, and typical attacks, but they're quick moving, aggressive. They're there to die, basically. What's known as the forlorn hope, they're going to take the breach and die in the process and kill as many of the enemy and occupy the enemy. So I love the fact that you've got these elite warrior versions of Uruk. <laughs> So just a brief comment about the numbers here, and um, it might seem that the people up on the walls are killing you know, huge numbers of, of the enemy, and this is not very realistic, but actually in siege warfare, the standard equation is that the attackers need to outnumber the defenders by a few times at least, um, because it's taking it, the whole point of a fortification is it's a force magnifier. You are up there on a wall, you've got height, you've got all the advantages, you've got a bit of wall in front of you to hide behind. Potentially, if you're shooting arrows, for example, you can have all of your ammunition up there. Defending a castle was often done by a relatively small garrison. And if we look at, for example, the wars in Northern Wales, Edward I's wars of conquest, we often see that Edward I's castles were only garrisoned by like 30 people and managed to hold out against far bigger numbers of attacking Welsh whilst reinforcements came to relieve them. So absolutely, it makes sense that the defenders should be able to take out loads of these attackers. And that's why you've really got to swarm with all of these attackers and all of these ladders. Absolutely, it's a good representation of the storming of a castle. So finally, orcs have learned how to form a testudo, as we'd call it. So them going up the ramp, if you've ever seen anything about Roman military, this is what the Romans did. This is what built the Roman Empire, was shield formations. And when they put them on top as well to make them defended against anything being thrown down or shot down, this is known as the testudo. <laughs> now, where the Urukai messed up and didn't do it as well as the Romans is the Romans would have had the shields around the sides, the back, the front, and on the top. And the silly old Urukai have only done the front and the top. So the elven archers can just shoot straight into their flanks, into the sides, and pepper them with arrows. So of course, landmines, but why did they need a single guy with a flaming torch to come and ignite it? Why couldn't one of the people carrying them in? They seem to carry them in there with no problem at all. Why couldn't one of those just have been holding the torch? I don't know. So believe it or not, this is not something that is unique to fantasy uh, because, of course, mines and, and bombs and explosive devices existed in, in the age of castles. So absolutely one of the ways to besiege a castle was to mine underneath a wall. And um, Before gunpowder, what they would have done is they put wooden struts up, then they put a load of combustible things down there, set fire to it. Saladin did this, for example, during the Third Crusade. And then when the wooden struts that you put in as you've tunneled underneath burn through, the wall hopefully collapses. But obviously once gunpowder comes along, what you can do is you can do a mine underneath the wall and put a bomb underneath. Absolutely, this is something, what you're seeing on screen here, is something that happened, many similar things happened in history. So again, the use of a battering ram is classic medieval and ancient world um, warfare, of course, and it was one of the primary ways, again, of gaining access to a fortification was to smash the door in. And obviously we might be familiar with high medieval and late medieval castles, which have incredibly elaborate gate systems, but going to more rudimentary castles and fortifications, and even if we go to the Roman era, then sometimes gateways weren't as complex and weren't as well protected as that. Often battering rams were encased inside a mobile vehicle, if we call it that, with wheels on and a roof. And this was to protect the people operating the battering ram from people throwing things down exactly as we see here. Commonly the things thrown down would be rocks and stones because they cost nothing and they're everywhere. Obviously things like spears and arrows, but also um, boiling things. It could be boiling water, it could be boiling oil, it could be sometimes uh, flaming oil. So usually in these periods where battering rams were a conventional part of warfare, they would protect the people operating the battering ram. In this case, the Urukai aren't quite this advanced aren't quite that clever and they're more happy to sacrifice their own troops as we've seen so they just 
get a big log and send some guys in with it. Just a minor detail, but when the Urukai come through that breach with lots of pikes forward, I personally think pikes are of dubious use in this particular scenario. Um, they're, they're rather long and unwieldy for this particular kind of potential engagement and they're not being used in a kind of formation where they provide a, a kind of hedgehog front as it were anyway there we go they, they, they it's good that pikes are in there because spears and pikes and things like that often get neglected in movies so an interesting detail of coming through a narrow space uh, in a uh, breach in the wall in this case is that the uh, defenders who in this case although they're num numerically inferior there's fewer of them if you allow the attackers to come slightly through the breach you're able to surround them so at any one time you might have three times as many men fighting against the attackers how you fight around that breach is very very important and will colossally affect the outcome of that engagement what you really want to do is at any one time make sure that more of your men fighting fewer of their men in that specific place even if overall they've got more men those men can't be brought to bear because it's a narrow space Yeah, I'm afraid 20 years haven't made that more comfortable for me to watch. <laughs> so this is one of those things that I'm afraid took me out of the scene. And I remember watching this in the cinema and, um, you know, when I saw it the next couple of times at home after that. This is a moment where this is a really serious, you know, kind of your blood's risen. You've seen what's at stake here. Everything's relatively serious, even when um, Gimli and Legolas are joking with each other about number of, of enemies felt. And then Legolas skateboards down a flight of stairs on a shield and then makes it fly off into someone's chair. It just, it, it's just too much, too much. <laughs> Sometimes less is more. Oh, and the stabbing with the arrows again. I really wish they would have used that less. I can understand why they do it, because it's kind of, I suppose, Legolas's equivalent of a bayonet, isn't it? Because when he's standing right next to people and he's supposed to be shooting at them, sometimes they're too close to shoot at, so he has to stab with the arrow. But I wish they'd made him use the knives more, because he's got this pair of daggers. And he does use them sometimes, but I wish that we'd seen them used a little bit more, and less of the stabbing with the arrows. Again, we've got fighting what's essentially at a breach where the doors, um, the gate's been broken. And this is something we find numerous historical accounts of across centuries, essentially. An age old tale of trying to hold people back at a narrow breach. And also, again, the numbers of Urukai are more or less irrelevant because they've been funneled into a narrow space. I'd also say that by and large, in this particular scenario, where there's a small opening, thrusting weapons are going to be particularly important. Pikes would be useful, spears, and with swords, not swinging them so much as um, stabbing and poking with them. And of course, as we see here, the arch is having a good effect, shooting through that aperture. And they could do it to some extent over the shoulders and round the sides of the people who are fighting with hand weapons. So really good, really realistic. So this little gate at the um, little door at the side would be commonly known as a sally port. They were actually really quite important things in medieval castles because, of course, if the opponents are blocking or attacking the main entrances, but for some reason you need to get a messenger out to um, send for reinforcements or help, or indeed to sally out, which means to send out forces to attack the attackers. Absolutely. Again, this is something we see for centuries, whether it's the ancient world or whether it's not 19th century warfare, very often defenders will attack the attackers when they're least expecting it. So at night or when they have uh, ceased their attack and gone back to camp. So it's great that they thought of having a sally port in there and it is realistic. And I'd also say it's a realistic location because it's at a place where it can't really be seen by the attackers. They wouldn't know it was there and they can't really get to it very easily either. Toss me. Gimli asking Aragorn to toss him will never stop being funny. <laughs> Now, is it just me, or was that an insanely long way to throw a door? My gosh, how strong is Aragorn? So... 
I always love this scene, um, but you know, it is quite silly because yes, you can train horses to ride through people. This myth that you can't get horses to charge into hikes or bayonets is not true because it was done historically. And yes, historically, sometimes it was specifically done to break an infantry formation. So you would sacrifice the horse and perhaps yourself in the process. So in 1860 in Persia, there was a famous example where British officers led a cavalry charge into an infantry square who were defended with bayonets and they just crashed into it. And of course the horses died, but the cavalry coming behind them were able to follow in through the break in the infantry formation, laying about with their sabers and they broke the infantry formation. So absolutely cavalry can break infantry formations, even when they've got pointy pole arms. The fact is that horses, while they're big powerful creatures, will trip and fall over. And there are so many urukai here that I find it hard to suspend my disbelief that they would be able to plow through so many people without gradually losing momentum and coming to a stop or stumbling and falling because you know horses have only got four hooves at the end of the day and if they accidentally step on an urukai and slip they're going to fall over and horses do fall over I, I think they attributed a little bit too much um potency to the horses in this particular scene and additionally, the Urukai only seem to attack the riders. They don't attack the horses. In reality, in medieval treatises talking about warfare, when you want to attack someone who's on a horse, you attack the horse because you bring the horse down, you bring the rider down. Absolutely, although it's horrible and we don't like to think about horses getting injured, if the opponent's trying to kill you, then you do whatever you can to defend yourself. So you hit the horse. So yeah, I have a little bit of a problem with this scene. So just like everybody, I absolutely love this scene. Uh, it's really rousing, it's perfect timing, it's visually beautiful. But man, that is a really, really steep slope to ride horses down. I'm not saying that people couldn't do it, but doing it with that number of people all moving in mass, it's just, I think, a recipe for disaster. And I think the reality is you would end up with several hundred rolling horses and men in a heap at the bottom of that slope. I think if the slope had just been like maybe 50% of that incline, then it would have looked just as impressive and more believable. So, yep, finally, the pikes. The pikes are useful. So we finally see the Urukai coming forwards with their pole weapons to present the points forwards. Exactly, yes, this is what infantry should do. Stick together, get your long pointy weapons in front, and that should prevent, generally speaking, should prevent cavalry from completely plowing through you. Essentially, aim at the horses. There are lots of things we can criticize about the siege. It did have the feeling of a siege and gave you some of the key elements. There were siege engines, there was a breach, there was a sally port, there was a battering ram with a gate, there was a keep that they retreated to after the curtain wall had been lost, there was the mention of water supply and other supplies, arrows, stuff like that. So yeah, it had a lot of the kind of key elements that you want from a siege battle, as it were. The only overarching thing, I guess, that by a medieval or ancient world siege that it was missing was the feeling of a prolonged thing that took at least days or weeks. It was a kind of, they turn up, they attack, and it's all over and done with in two hours. It was all a bit, it was all, all a bit, seemed a bit too quick, I guess. But I can see why they did that for dramatic effect. And I think it had so many of the key elements for siege. I think it was really well done. For more from Matt Easton, make sure to watch our previous video where he reacts to fight scenes from The Fellowship of the Ring, or make sure to take a look at our IGN Expert Reacts playlist.